Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. We are halfway in our pursuit across the rooftops to find the Cracks Woman. So we've been going a little bit hard so we're going to carry on. We might as well <laughs> grab a low hanging rope. A stray rope tempts you hanging from the anarchic webwork of the flit above. If you seize it at speed, you could swing to the next roof. It's only a 50% chance, but we've been doing acrobats all the way, so let's give it a go. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Your hands grip the rope with a pleasing friction, and you swing out over a six-story drop. The cracks woman glances back, dismayed by your audacity. As your forward movement slows, you release the rope and drop, steadying yourself on a convenient chimney. She turns away and runs, desperation in her steps. You press on across the roofs, breathing hard. The cracks woman is in your sights. You are a few feet behind her now, almost close enough to grab her shoulder. Let's trust our instincts. Confidence is everything during a frantic pursuit, punctuated by deadly drops. You dash across a ridge and slide down the mossy slate, springing at the last moment to a neighboring roof. There is just enough grip on the gable edge to ascend quickly to the apex, where you seize the finale to swing yourself around in one fluid movement. Plummeting towards the drop, you use your momentum to leap to a lower terrace. You roll with the impact and come out at speed. The cracks woman stares at your acrobatics for a few seconds, mesmerized. You press on across the roofs, breathing hard. The cracks woman is in your sights. You lunge. A loose slate betrays you and your fingertips brush her jacket as you slip. Now we can spring the trap. Three levels below, the cracks woman has swung into a thin gap between upper stories, only to find one end is blocked. Can you descend in time to trap her there? I would imagine so. You take a moment to relax your body, then apply a technique you've only seen demonstrated, rebounding from wall to wall without a proper hold using the friction of the bricks to slow your descent. To your surprise, and the cracks woman's, it works perfectly and you land like a tiger. Damn you, she spits. What do you want? Back taxes? You've trapped the cracks woman in a civilized conversation. She seems ready to talk. Ask about the committee, you've worked hard enough for the chance. The capricious cracks woman looks relieved. Was that what you wanted to talk about? You should have said, you'd have saved us both a lot of bother. You remind her that she bolted from the window before you could get a word in. The committee wasn't my usual role. I'm more confident taking an upstairs window than sitting around a debating table. But they wanted opinion from a cross section of staff. She looks at her shoes. I can't say the question made me happy, and our decision made me sick to my stomach. But I'm used to stealing from people. This was the same thing on a much larger scale. At least, that's what I tell myself. So we've learned that the cracks woman was unhappy with the committee's decision. Well, let's demand her piece of the document. Apparently we're making her feel uncomfortable. Her explanation was obtuse, if heartfelt. Would you need her quarter of the document? The cracks woman gives a little snort. The funny thing is, I still carry it every day. State secrets and all. She opens her jacket, pops a pocket knife and slices the lining. From a hidden pocket, she pulls out a torn piece of paper covered in jagged black handwriting. Take it. Make me Might make me lighter on my feet. You glance at the fragment has negotiated a period of seven days. You need the other pieces to make sense of it. Wait, says the crack woman. You'll need this too. She tosses you a blue crystal brooch. Ah, I think that that's what we need for the man in... Was it Vale Gardens? No, it wasn't Veil Garden, it was Lady Burns Road. Okay, this library is beginning to feel like your lodgings. Is any tea available? Okay, let's just... Read the signs. Yep, that's the easiest way of finding him. Uh, photographer looks up as you approach. Hello, he says. What a coincidence. Here's the brooch. 
splendid. The cryptographer takes the brooch over to a lantern and peers sideways through the crystal into the flame. He hums for a moment, then sips, slips the brooch into his pocket and begins to print a grid of letters on the nearest item, which is a small album of inferior botanical illustrations. He projects horizontal and diagonal lines creating other letters. This goes on for some minutes. When it becomes clear he has forgotten all about you, you cough as politely as you can manage. What fresh hell is this? <laughs> I'm sorry, he gives you a dazzling smile. I've, been, I've so enjoyed our conversation and you've been the most tremendous help, but I really must get on with my work. Uh, what was it you wanted again? Ask about the document yet again. It's that, or murder him. Oh yes, I remember. The, con the Conville cryptographer examines his grid of letters for a few seconds, then says, Left pocket. He reaches into his jacket and brings out a tattered piece of le a letter. Here it is. Have it a help. With admiral restraint, you read some text from the torn section. News. And on no account must this be allowed to. You will need the other three quarters to make sense of it. You are done with the cryptographer for now, thankfully. So the only place left to go now is the place that I just accidentally went. Veil Garden. To find the chameleon. No, we don't actually know what this person looks like. You stroll around Veil Garden with no clear idea how to proceed. You know very little of the chameleon. Only a rough physical description. Oh wow, there's a lot of options here. We can ask around the pubs. Vale Garden has all manner of options for drinkers. Stylish, intimate, and murderous. We can invite yourself to a bohemian party. There's always one going on somewhere. Uh, lurk in honey dens. To stay focused, you'll need to avoid temptation. Talk to spurned suitors. They'd rather they gather down by the river. Uh, survey the coffee houses. All of London comes here. Well, most of Vale Garden anyway. Or we can consult the poets. They tend to be nearly aware of the successes of their rivals. Let's survey the coffee houses first. You talk to the owners during their slack periods. Certain elements recur in their stories. A figure that they think was a woman but not, might not have been. Ingratiation with an influential group which meets regularly at the coffee house, that same figure securing a loan from a third party on the basis of their association with said group, then an abrupt disappearance. Optionally, key members of the group find they have been pickpocketed. I think I've seen three or four people doing the same thing, muses one proprietor as she grinds beans. They all look very similar. Oh great, there's m loads of them that all look the same. Okay, let's go to some pubs. Coffee house, then the pubs, why not? In the singing mandrake, you learn that a man fitting the chameleon's description has been getting people drunk, seeing them home safely, then robbing the place. In the irate locksmith, you learn that a woman fitting the chameleon's description has been offering to fix valuable watches at a discount, and fencing them in spite instead. In the lamb and flagellant, you learn that someone intends to kill you with a tap assembly they have ripped from the bar. Time for last orders. <laughs> I'm guessing that was the murderous pub. Now let's have, invite ourselves to a bohemian party. It's easy to talk about mysterious, attractive strangers at these things. Several times you are mistaken for somebody given an impromptu reticle and asked for some salacious detail. An artist's model slides up to you at the wine table. I want to find somebody, I think. She takes the last glass of the 82, sips it, and makes a face. I meet a lot of so-called artists whose interests are less than aesthetic. She talked about doing me in oils, but she wasn't quite up for the pigments. I turned her down. She moved on to my friend, heartbroken and robbed within an hour. Damn, this chameleon is brutal. Sport breaks out in the street, laughing drinkers tossing a frothy tankard back and forth like a rugby football. Could that be... no? A constable moves in. Uh, let's lurk in the honey dens. A 
afternoon blends into evening among the cushions and candles, the well-to-do and the ne'er-do-wells. Figures from society and the worlds of art and literature enter and drift off to alcoves where you can eavesdrop as they murmur and mutter. After a few hours of unhelpful talk, you overhear something from the girl cleaning the cushions out back. Yeah, he said something about... The new civet's no good. I thought they were talking about baking. You know, with the flour. Given their pattern, you think you have narrowed down the chameleon's address to a certain lane not far from the singing mandrake. Okay, so we can either talk to poets or, or spurn suitors. I'm gonna go, I don't like poets. So let's go spurn suitors. <laughs> you walk to a bank a little downstream. After the despairing, dramatic gesture of throwing themselves in the river, the Vale Garden set normally wash up here, cold, hungry, and hatless. After you filter out the regular suspects, you get some intelligence on the chameleon. They do like to seduce, but their own carnal desires are secondary to a certain creative viciousness. They draw out their victim's deepest desire, promise them a lifetime of it, then they melt away into the night. A drunk bohemian expresses a grudging respect for their behaviour as an artistic statement. Ah, so we found the address. All other doors have been eliminated. This must be the one. You're sure this is the spot. Time to catch your... Lacetillian friend? Lacetillian friend? Two separate people have described the chameleon disappearing into this lane. One door is home to feuding families, another to what is almost certainly a scarlet stocking establishment. The only leaves the third. And it has something one of the chameleon's discarded companions remembered. A particularly ornate letterbox. You perch in a convenient alcove and wait from afternoon to lunchtime. The door does not open once. You stretch weary muscles. It looks like an illicit entry is required. You cross the street and get to work on the lock. You let yourself in to a sumptuous suit suite of rooms. Behind a drawing room and bedchamber is a small, well-appointed library, and behind that a room with more outfits than the costume department of a major theatre. Uh, we can... Search carefully for the document. No sense in advertising you were here. The, your subtle quality gives us a 90% chance of success. Or we can upend the place. The chameleon caused chaos in other people's lives. Time for a taste of it here. Let's try the subtle approach. We failed. Damn it. The chameleon seems to value appearance over substance. You go to the wardrobe and search the clothes, delving into every pocket and feeling the lining of every coat. After nearly two hours, you open a dusty hat box to find a moth-eaten topper. Uncurled up inside is the document. You glance at the snippet. It's convinced that the delegation has the ability to follow through. Try stuff. You replace the hat box and slip out the front door. A neighbour leans from an upstairs window, staring at you. Best to act like you own the place. Her eyes follow you as you leave. Ah, oh, balls. Close, but not quite. So, I guess now we just have to assemble the document. There were four quarters, one in Cryptographer in Ladybones Road, one with the Tormentor in Watchmaker's Hill, one with the Crackswoman in Spite, and one with the Chameleon in Vale Garden. Put the pieces together. You have been all over the city to recover this. Why is it so important? You fit the four quarters together. The bottom edge is still ragged, but the full text is revealed in bold, jagged, black ink. The Queen is convinced the delegation has the ability to follow through on its promises, and has transferred ownership of the capital to our new friends. The Queen has negotiated a period of seven days before the transfer will take place. We are well aware of the potential for social unrest at this news and on no account must this be allowed to jeopardise the exchange. The Queen, therefore, instructs the government to decide how and when this information should be presented to the public. That's when the Queen sold London to the Masters, I believe. Let's return to the Chairman. 
He seems a little smaller already, sagging shoulders and a shrunken chest. The missing piece. The bottom edge of the reconstructed letter is ragged. Does the chairman have the fifth piece? The eyes between the bandages glisten. I knew you were a sharp one. Yes, I did keep a piece. Chairman's prerogative. With a grunt of effort, he unscrews the top of the bedpost and draws out a rolled slip of paper. You unroll it along the bottom of your recovered document. It has one word and one letter. Victoria R. Seven days. Queen Victoria negotiated seven days before the fall. Her subjects had the opportunity to leave London, but the committee decided not to tell them. Why? The chairman's hand flutters to his chest. Some felt there would be riots in the street, a revolution in the French style. Others believed that the Queen's bargain included the lives of Londoners, their dreams. He coughs into his hand. Their love stories, we didn't know what the masters were capable of and we feared total destruction. It was a capitulation. Every day since, I have thought of the children who might have chosen a life under the sun, but instead were forced into darkness. And now? The secret is yours. His eyes roll back. A long exhalation passes his dry lips. You now have one last breath. As you take in the consequences of his confession, the chairman arcs his back and tears open his pyjama top. Flimsy wings unwrap beneath a lattice of parting skin, his secret passed on. He is unburdened, ready to move to the next stage. Your decision here will end this exceptional story. So we have four options. We can rebury the secret. What would happen if the people of London found out? Can't be sure. We can break the story wide open. London deserves to know, even decades later. But can you get word out? I'm going to go with probably not, considering... I don't think the Ministry of Public Decency would have too much to say with that one. They'd probably block it. Uh, demand an audience with Her Majesty. You need an explanation. Or kill them off. The chairman was in charge. It was his responsibility. I think demanding an audience with Her Majesty. Not that we'll get it. But just in case we do, that's what I'm going with. You turn up at the shuttered palace long after polite hours. With Vim in your step and Steel in your gaze. After two separate standoffs with increasingly burly footmen, you somehow secure an audience with the Queen's private secretary. He studies your document without surprise and slides it into a drawer. I'm sure you would agree with me that Her Majesty was entirely correct to leave this in the hands of public servants. If you disagree with their decision, that is hardly a matter for the Crown. He adopts a placatory tone. The Queen surely appreciates your diligence in this matter, and the Palace can offer you its endorsement in the future. Do you care for a glass of rather good wine? Or should I recall the footman? The best offer you'll get. Well, that wasn't quite what I was after. It basically got buried again, but it got buried with the royal family. Instead of me doing it myself, but I do dig I did get two personal recommendations, a bottle of Broken Giant, and four favours in high places. But either way, that is the end of the exceptional story. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. If you did any of the other four endings, please let me know what they were. I am kind of interested. And as always, see you next time.